Zagba Oyote, and uh, I have the privilege of uh, having this conversation with uh, June Mill, a lady who's done a lot to preserve African cultural history and of the, some of the important works of uh, Osajipo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. When and how did you meet Kwame Nkrumah? Well, it goes back a long way. In fact, I'm celebrating my the Golden Jubilee because it's 60 years ago when I met him in the year of independence. So Ghana's celebrating, so am I, here in London. Yes, I met him towards the end of 1957 at a Commonwealth conference here. And he had asked to meet me because um, he was embarking on his second book, I Speak of Freedom, and he needed a research assistant and so on to help select suitable speeches and excerpts of broadcasts and things to go into this second book. And um, my husband had worked for Nelson's, which published his auto autobiography that also came out in 1957. So he asked my husband, you know, if there was, he could think of anyone, and he um, <laughs> said, well, his wife was a historian and had written some history books and so on. She knew about publishing processes. Right, right. And so he phoned me up from Accra. Oh, he phoned you? Yes, mm. from, from his office at Flagstaff House. Mm. <laughs> we were living in Edinburgh then. Um, and he knew, you see, that we'd spent three years living in what was then the Gold Coast. We both lectured at the University College of the Gold Coast. So he knew that I knew something about the country and its history and so on. So anyhow, he phoned me up and said he was coming to a Commonwealth Prime Minister's Conference in a few months and would I um, like to consider working on this um, second book? And um, if so, we could meet, you see, when he was in London. So <laughs> of course I immediately said yes, uh, I'd love to do that. So that's when I first met him. So why in London? Why in London? And uh, how, how was the meeting like? Oh, well it was terrific really. He was staying at the Grosvenor House Hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time he stayed there, I think after that he always stayed at the Ghana High Commissioner's place. Okay. But he was staying there at that time. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of people waiting to see him. We were in some sort of big room there waiting to meet him. Mm -hmm. and um, so. He, Yes, it was <laughs> quite electrifying, really, because mm -hmm. I knew a lot about him, of course, being a historian and, and having been in Ghana and so on. And, um, but his actual presence is really, really quite something. I mean, it's, the, it's, it's perfectly true, this charisma he had. This charisma he had. Oh, yes, yeah. tremendous impact he had. Well, he, and yet such a modest person. He came in with one or two Ghanaians, you know, that had been at the meeting, I suppose. And everyone stood up. There were about 50 of us there, actually. Um, various people from different walks of life waiting to meet him. And he just smiled, you know, and said, why don't you sit down? <laughs> so we all, he, he dispelled the formality mm. straight away. Mm. Um, anyhow, he went round greeting these people, and P Van was with him, my husband Van, um, and apparently, according to what Van told me, he suddenly said, where's June? Because, you know, his books were top priority with him, and he, he really wanted to get on with meeting me, but anyhow, he came over, and um, he drew up a chair as, as close as you're sitting there now, really, <laughs> and his first question was, tell me all about yourself, you see, and I, I was a bit sort of flabbergasted, I didn't know where to begin. So he said, uh, he helped me out, <laughs> he said, um, you studied history, his, you're a historian. I said, yes. And he said, which university did you go to? And I said, London. And he said, oh, thank God it wasn't Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> you must be a radical. <laughs> so that really broke the ice. Yes, he liked the fact that you went to the University of London. Oh yes, yes. he thought I must be a radical, yes. He, he, he always hated what these sort of Oxford accent stuff that people right. put on sometimes. Yes. He couldn't stand that. But anyhow, no, that was a, a bit of a joke. But he said, I've got to you know, speak to a lot of people here. Can, I'm having an informal lunch in a room next door. C can you stay for lunch? We could talk it over. Just myself and you and Van and my secretary Erica Powell at that time, just the, the four of us. And so th that's where we discussed it and so on. And that's, that was the beginning really of, well, the long association with his publishing books and so on, until he died in fact in 1972. 
So not, not only was he somebody who had great charisma that affected well, people when they saw him, but he also yeah. had this gift to put people at ease. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, I saw it very much at close range in um, the Conakry period, mm. um, where it, if it's extraordinary, really, the, the effect he had there. Um, some of the when he first went there, some of the um, cabinet ministers and secretaries government, you see, came to meet him because you know he was. Um, co-president of Guinea. Yes, he was. Yeah, well, Secretary wanted to step down and make him president, mm. but he only accepted to be co-president. Mm. Anyhow, they came to greet him, and I, I had a desk at the end of the long veranda in his place where his office was, you know. So I used to see these people come in and hear them, what they said, and I can remember vividly one of them saying, um, how do you like, would you like me to address you? Should it be um, president? doctor or a sagifo and there was a slight force and Krumah smiled and he said my name is Kwame and Krumah <laughs> I thought that was so <laughs> typical yeah yes, indeed. Yes, mm. indeed. so let's go back to the actual work of publishing his books yes first you do the I speak of freedom yes and then subsequently how did the relationship develop as a well before the coup there was a, a marked change you see in after the coup but mm -hmm. going back to before the coup mm -hmm. Um, his London publishers did his books. Who his publishers? Well, that? Thomas Nelson Thomas and Thomas Son, yeah. uh, that's the company my husband worked for, first of all. Uh, and then... Uh, Perhaps to clarify that, your husband worked for Thomas... Thomas Nelson and Sons, they yes. Published they published his first book, um, first major book, mm -hmm. uh, which was his autobiography, and that uh, came out at Independence, as you know. Mm -hmm. it was actually pub you know, um, published on that day formally in Accra. Um, they, and then after a few years my husband moved to Heinemann Educational Books and so <laughs> Krumer wanted to keep um, Van as his editor. Right. They got on very well on a personal level as well as a professional level and so he switched to Heinemann mm. after that. So before the coup there were these two London publishers but the big change came after the coup, right. you see, when um, um, it was a disgraceful thing, really. But at the time of the coup, um, the two London publishers, I should exempt my husband here, he wanted to resign, he was so furious. But they decided they wouldn't um, be publishing any more of his books, you see. I think it was a commercial decision. Yes, commercial yes decision. because they sold a lot of textbooks in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And they, frankly, I think they made, they made a very um, a great mistake, really. They thought nothing more would be heard of him. Anyhow, he probably wouldn't be writing any more books, so it wasn't that important. But my husband was furious. He wasn't in a top position. He was their overseas editor. But the, the board, you know, decided, no, um, we, if we publish anything he might be writing, they didn't think he would, actually, um, then probably our books won't sell in Ghana, our textbooks won't be s sold in Ghana. So anyhow, he was dropped by them. And um, of course, one of the first things he started to do in Conakry was to, to write a Dark Days in Ghana about the Ghana coup. And so it was necessary to find another publisher. So we roll, we roll forward to post-66 then. Yes, yes. And uh, there is a coup. Mm. Krumah now lives in the Conakry as, uh, as co-president. Co-president, And yes. he wants his work out. Did you think that his, his writing was very important to him? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. One of the first things he, he did when he arrived at, uh, in Guinea mm. um, was to set up an office. Um, and Secretary um, closed the Ghana embassy. He, you know, at the time of the coup, he was so furious about yes. the coup in Ghana. And made all their equipment there, um, their desks, their typewriters, all that sort of thing, available to Nkrumah, which was moved then right. into his... Um, residence at Villa Silly. Mm -hmm. And so he he was really able to establish a um, sort of office routine very quickly, within a few weeks, in fact, he'd so got it going. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a new focus in his writing after after 66? Yes, yes, I would say there was. The first book, he wanted to expose the what was behind the Ghana coup. Right. Um, because he realized, well, everyone did, I think, who had any political awareness, that it, it 
wasn't an uprising of the Ghanaian people, it was an organized um, military coup, which in those days was commonplace. I mean, there had right. been 22 or something, 25 probably, right. um, between, well, before the, before before the Ghana one. Right. Yeah, it was, uh, it was getting a sort of routine thing, so easy to carry out just mm. a few military and police people in the capital and the, the country's yours, you know, it was easy in those days. But he wanted to expose the, um, the external and also some of the internal forces behind it because there was an opposition in, in Ghana who didn't like his radical policies and so on. So there was a mixture of the two, but that was the purpose of that book. And uh, he was writing, he was at his desk within weeks of arriving in so as soon as he got to Conakry, Conakry. he got busy. Yeah. He wasn't sitting there in the corner. No, 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 certainly not. No. And uh, secretaries and um, cabinet ministers really called on him all the time. I mean, when they left the country on a mission, when they came back, they reported, you know, as though he was a head of state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had terrific regard for him yeah. in Guinea. So the people in Guinea really, really welcomed him. Oh, yes. Um, I think there was this um, love of Ghana, really, because when they were in a tight spot, you know, when they said the famous, secretary said the famous no, you know, to de Gaulle, mm -hmm. they, Guinea would not be joining the French community. They were very stuck because the French really were, were very mean. They even took the electric light bulbs out of things. They took everything away with them. And Guinea w was poor. Um, so they were in a spot. And and Krumah was in a position where he could arrange for a, a, what well was supposed to be a loan, yeah, but it was a gift really yeah. of 10 million, I don't know what, <laughs> whether it was dollars or what, <laughs> what, but anyhow, it tided them over. Mm -hmm. And I think the Guinea people never forgot it. And of course there had been the Ghana Guinea Mali yeah, Union yeah, before yeah. then, so they, they felt tied to mm -hmm. Ghana in a way. No, they were terribly proud to have Nkrumah in their country. So now, with in, in terms of uh, your work as his publisher. Mm. How tell us a little bit about mm. uh, the setting up of Panav Publish publications. Ah, uh, yes. yes so well, I have mentioned that uh, you know he was stuck for a publisher mm. after mm. the coup. So uh, when he'd um, done the manuscript of Dark Days in Ghana, I was out there by the way in in June. Yes, he he arrived in Conakry in March. I was okay, out so there the in coup June. Was in February '66. By March, he was in Conakry. That's right. And you were there? Uh, in June, yeah, okay. because he was already... Um, and also, you see, that his book, Challenge of the Congo, was in process of publication at the time of the coup. So, and he wanted to do a new preface for that. So he, s he sent for me that um, in June, and so I was out there. Um, yes, he was going... The, the question of a publisher was a, a problem because... Um, there was literally no company. So he asked me to find out what it would cost to set up his own um, publishing company. Um, because he realized, I think, that if he'd been dropped by Heinemann and Nelson, there wouldn't be another UK mm -hmm. publisher, because he was not supposed to be in power anymore. <laughs> Total underestimation of his political stature, but never mind. That was very common in those days. Um, so I found out it only cost a hundred pounds to s register a company. In that case, if, you know, you can print, you couldn't print a book here without having a company a name to put on it. So it was his idea, he said, well, register Panaf Books, call it Panaf Books. That was a very typical choice of title, wasn't it? So the little company was registered and um, it only involved myself and Krumah and Douglas Rogers was very useful at the time because he had a small office in Fleet Street. Right. He was the editor of Africa and the World, mm -hmm. a very well-known magazine that the Ghana government during Nkrumah's time had established in London to give news of what was happening in Ghana and in the rest of Africa. It was called Africa and the World. So that's where I operated from. Shared a desk actually with the treasurer of, of Africa and the World magazine. Mm -hmm. It was an attic room, just one room, mm -hmm. at the top of um, 89 Fleet Street. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. so that's how it all started. I see. So yeah. bet between, uh, 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 so after 66, your visits to Conakry now will be regular. 
because he's writing so much. Yes. Okay, tell us a bit about that. <laughs> that for a number of times you went there, the oh, well, I I went found the situation, mm. how it was like, how you mm. coped with everything. Mm. Just, you know. Mm. Well, between 1966 and 1972 when he died, I went 16 times. 16? Yes, yeah. It worked out about every two or three months, really. The rate at which he worked was phenomenal. He wrote a lot then. Never stopped really, um, uh, apart from the books he wrote then, which are some of his most important, I think. Um, he was writing pamphlets as well, you know. Um, he was never happier than when he was at his desk and so on. And fortunately, with the uh, people that travelled with him to the Hanoi mission, um, you know, when the coup took place in his absence, um, were secretarial staff, uh, it was a, quite a big entourage he had f on that mission and they all remained loyal and went with him to Guinea so he had secretarial help yes they all went there was about uh, some joined him later I can't tell you the number but it was quite an impressive number how included his own cook you see which he always traveled with a, f a few secretarial staff photographers and so on and I owe a lot of the photographs I've got during that period to the cameramen that went on that mission, you see, and they stayed with him. Unfortunately, their film uh, ran out mm -hmm. after a while, and they couldn't replace the equipment, you know, in Conakry. But I've got some lovely photographs of that period, which um, mm -hmm. wouldn't have happened without these loyal people that mm -hmm. followed him there. They were offered, um, you know, their fare back to Accra if they didn't wish to remain with him, but they wanted to, they wanted to remain with him. They remained very, very loyal. So every time you went, you, you, you had some more uh, uh, work that he'd completed that you were coming to publish? Or yes, that's right, because in those days, um, publishing was more complicated than it is now. You had to go through galley proofs, mm -hmm. page proofs, and each stage had to be checked out, you see, which involved... An, a he, M Nkrumah was meticulous about his writing. Every word had to be gone through, you know, at each stage. And if he wasn't sure about the word he would turn to me sometimes and say is that the best word to use in that context it's your language not mine <laughs> so you know he was a stickler really but a great joy f for a, an editor to work with because you know he insisted on the highest standard um, and the accuracy of everything he said yes it involved a lot of toing and froing which I think publishing processes now have simplified a bit, you know, you put it on disc and all this sort of thing. But in those days there was a lot of checking to do. And um, I used to take supplies for him, you know, some of the, the sp medicines and things for his um, entourage they couldn't get in Conakry. So, I was a <laughs> um, but I never spent more than about, I think the maximum was three weeks. You know, it was short, you there were short three visits. Three weeks there working with him and then... Yes, that's back. right. I used to work every day in the villa. Mm -hmm. I had a desk there at the end of his veranda. He had this, it was an old colon French colonial style residence. It was quite a modest place where some, I suppose, French official would have stayed in colonial times. Right. And um, the secretary made that available for him. Mm -hmm. It was facing the sea, a lovely, lovely place, really. And I had the opportunity to meet people like Cabral, which was so interesting oh, for me. Amilcar Cabral. Yes, Amilcar Cabral was a frequent visitor there because he was fighting this guerrilla war in Portuguese Guinea at the time. And one of the books that Nkrumah was working on in Conakry was the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. And so I think Cabral was very interested in that and probably contributed quite a bit to the ideas in that book. Oh, Cabral was a, a lovely person, spoke fluent English, and they, oh, I mean, he was in and out an awful lot, as were other um, guerrillas, you know, from other parts of Africa. He kept in touch with freedom fighters from other parts of Africa as well. So he was very busy in those days. Yes. Writing a lot, having meetings. That's and I right. Think he also published uh, some of the correspondence, didn't he? Yes. Correspondence, yeah. Yes, that's right, in the Conakry years. That's only a, a small selection, really. Mm -hmm. But he had a huge um, mail coming in mm -hmm. every day from supporters all over the world. 
that's what I tried to show in my book on the Conakry years, but I could only give a small part of it, really. So his um, secretaries were kept very, very busy dealing with the mail, not to mention the cables and things that came in, you see, as well. So let's roll forward a little bit to Romania towards the end, and then we'll go back to mm -hmm. you going back to Conakry to, yeah. Yes. So mm -hmm. then one day you hear he's not very well. Mm? He's one day you go and it's okay, next time you go it's not very well. Well, I noticed from, well, he, everything seemed to be pretty well all right till 1968. He was in terrific health then, although I was a bit uneasy because within six months of his arrival in Conakry, the cook that he relied on so much and did all his food for him, um, which he always travelled with, uh, Amoa, I think his name was, uh, or Amua, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. However, um, he was dead within six months. He and died. He, Yes, he was a fit man. I think, uh, I think he was um, helped on his way, to tell you the truth. But after that, um, Nkrumah's food was not safe, really. The various cooks came out from Conakry and so on. I can't prove any of this, but I have a strong suspicion that um, he, Nkrumah was poisoned in the end in a slow, nasty sort of way. But um, Amoa was probably the first casualty, I think, because he was a fit man, and then suddenly he, he's vomiting, he's unwell, he's taken to hospital, and they said, oh, he's got, he's got cancer, you know, and he's dead within six months. It was really inexplicable, but after that, it was a, I, I felt very concerned, really. There was no check on his f food, really. Cooks were coming up from Conakry, and of course, in those days, the American embassy was open. I heard since, I didn't know at the time, that one of the cooks that came had been working at the American embassy. But he was very fit till about 1968. Then I began to notice his losing weight. Um, inexplicably, he seemed to be eating all right, but he, he wasn't so well. Um, as he had been. So by 69, 70? 69, 70, he was losing weight, yes, and he was having stomach upsets. He never had trouble like that before. But he was a very fit man through it. Very fit, yes. Um, I think that one of the Vietnamese or Chinese doctor, uh, I think it was a Vietnamese doctor that attended him mostly when he was in Conakry, said he had the blood pressure of a young man, uh, you know, when he was first there, but there was this rather slow deterioration, and quite noticeably about 1970, he was definitely a sick man. And he wanted to really to get a medical checkup in um, Moscow, because he had great faith in Russian <laughs> medicine, and he didn't want, obviously, to go anywhere in the West. Um, but it was the unfortunate time because the Russians were hobnobbing with the West. It was a time of detente. Yes. They'd uh, opened an embassy in Accra and he was told that it would be inopportune was the word they used for him to travel to Moscow for a checkup. But they could recommend a very good clinic in Bucharest and Ceausescu was okay. there, uh, you know, um, an ally really of the Russians at the time. So he went, he went there, um, but by that time he, he was a, a very sick man. So by 71 he had to check into the hospital or he... He, he you know, no, but um, in the autumn really of 1971 he went to Bucharest for, really, for a checkup, yeah. but um, he died there unfortunately. Yes, yes, the following yeah. April he was, he was by that time seriously yeah. ill. So you saw him. You saw him once or twice in, in, in Bucharest. Bucharest? Yeah. Yes, I went three times there three times. actually. Yes. Mm. Mm. And each time you saw that he's, he was deteriorating more or less. Oh yes. Well, I, I got a terrible shock when I my first visit there. But he had warned me. And typical of him, he he phoned up and said, um, "We must be courageous. I'm not as you remember me." And I thought, I. Whoa. What exactly does he mean? He's probably gone, his hair's gone white or something. Mm -hmm. But I got a terrible shot when I saw him. He was sitting up in, in a chair and his legs were terribly swollen. He said he'd been sitting there for six weeks because he was too painful to lie down. And um, he wasn't, they brought a, 
a sort of light meal, but um, he didn't obviously didn't fancy any of it. And uh, I couldn't get any sense out of the doctor there. Oh, no, they wouldn't tell me. I didn't. Well, he had a couple of Ghanaians from his entourage that went with him mm. to Bucharest. Uh, wonderful people. Um, Kwam was one. What was the other one? Oh, Yamike was there as well. Okay. You know, his nephew that had okay. been with him in Conakry and always travelled with him. And they said, we can't find out. They won't tell us what's what's wrong with him. Perhaps that you mm. can find out. Mm. So I asked if I could see the um, doctor? doctor in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not in, in, in Kuma's presence, of course. And he said, are you, the, are you his wife? And I said, no, I'm not his wife, but I'm his publisher. And I'm very concerned about, mm. you know, his health. And so he, he flannelled a bit. He, he didn't tell me what. He said, um, if we'd seen him two years ago, maybe we could have done something, but we can't. There's nothing we can do now. So I said, well, is it cancer, you see? Because a lot of people were saying it was in the press here that he'd got cancer. And the doctor didn't say no he just said oh why does everyone talk about cancer but he said it's all over him and I said well what is all over him I couldn't get anything out of it. I don't know what they made of it but um, I still maintain I think he was poisoned yes on the, on the, this is very um was he still writing um, in, in, in Bucharest That's well we were when um, in 1971 when he left there um, Revolutionary Path, his last book, was in process, really. I mean, it was being compiled. It wasn't actually in the process of publication. But it, as you probably know, it was uh, to be a book of major speeches with introductory passages. And of course, there'd been people writing into him, <laughs> saying it'd be nice to have a book with, that contains all the important um, speeches and things and to take account of what he'd written in Conakry. So he thought that was a good idea. It was his choice of title. And it, again, this is very typical of his modesty because he said, first of all, call it, I think an appropriate title would be My Revolutionary Path. Then he said, no, cut out the My Revolutionary Path. That was very typical. Yes, the, it was pretty well complete by the time he went to Bucharest, but they hadn't, the conclusion wasn't finished. Mm -hmm. And that's what was finished, well, in the last few weeks of his life. Actually, he didn't write it, of course. He dictated it to me. So as he was lying on his yes, bed? Yes, when he was on his bed, on his deathbed, as it he turned out. Then. Yes, he was telling me what he wanted in it. And then um, I was writing it down, you see. And then he said, read it to me. So I read it out to him, and he said, I could add more, but not now, because I think he was in awful pain. He had another injection. And frankly, I didn't feel I could press him any more the next day when I saw him, because well, he was, he was so ill. In fact, I think he'd said it all, reading it through. I can't think what he could have wanted to add to it. It's all there. I, I, so now there is a... So the, the next time you hear, he's gone. He's departed this life, as it Yes. Is. And mm. then you set about rescuing his papers and his uh, mm. well, personal his books from Conakry. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, well, I think realizing he was very seriously ill towards the end of 1970, he and probably realizing by then that he was not going to get back to Accra, mm. He wanted to safeguard the future of his books, so he made a will in Conakry, um, leaving me in charge of his copyright and his published and unpublished papers and books. And he got um, it properly witnessed and everything, and I had to get an English lawyer to witness it for him. And he had it um, signed in Conakry legally. Um, so that was very fortunate and a great foresight of his, really, because I might have had problems. Big, big, big problem. Yeah, saying, what right, you know? But he had appointed me as literary secretary, and so I had the permission to um, keep his books in print. Obviously, there were going to be no more books, but the important thing was to keep his books in print. That was another purpose of setting up Panath, 
because the books he wrote before the coup, um, the publishers, the London publishers, were going to pulp their remaining stock. Yeah, it was, it was terrible. They thought there wouldn't be any demand for them. Totally underestimated his political stature and so on. So the purpose of Panhaf was to keep those titles in print and also to print the new books he was to write in Guinea. There were some very important books, of course, before the coup. You see, Africa Must Unite. Tell us more about that. Why? And Neocolonialism, Why? two of his major works. Awesome. Well, Africa Must Unite, I mean, the title says it all, and that message is still valid today. But Neocolonialism was <laughs> in part responsible for the coup <laughs> because it exposed, you know, the workings of international finance capital in Africa actually gave charts showing the, the network of these big foreign companies that were exploiting Africa's resources. And that was probably the final straw in deciding this dangerous man has got to be removed, you know. <laughs> we cannot have Africa united or in control of its own resources. And so that was a factor because it had such an impact in America. The American government immediately stopped aid to Ghana when that book really? was published, yes, and lodged a very strong diplomatic um, uh, complaint, you know, through their embassy in Accra, complaining about the book. I don't know any other book, really, that has created such a, s a political stir as that one. The challenge of the Congo? <laughs> well, that wasn't perceived as such a great threat. You see, it was concentrated on the Congo. It did expose Union Minier, you know, and how the mm. Belgian company had um, exploited the Congo's wealth, but this book was really dynamite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, but it was the final straw in a big build-up that had been going on for some time against his policies and especially his Pan-Africanism, which was perceived as a great threat. I think it is still perceived as a threat, because once Africa is united, it'll be in control of its own resources. And that's the last thing, really, that these economic interests want. What kind of audience do you think Kwame Nkrumah had in mind when he was writing? What kind of audience do you think he had in mind? Well, it wasn't just for the Ghanaian public. <laughs> it, was a, it was a global thing, because he regarded what well, people have called his political philosophy in Krumerism, but he regarded it as um, a global mm. um, movement. And it, it still is very much so today, I think. Um, because the problems of Ghana and Africa as a whole mm. are replicated in the Far East. There's still, it's still ongoing in various parts of Africa and in South America. These are the great areas, you know. No, he wasn't right. Basically, he had in mind, obviously, the, the Pan-African mm -hmm. uh, readership. But it was a global thing, which being a statesman that he was, his vision incorporated in a sort of global um, context. And if you look at his friends and his contacts, you've got Castro, mm -hmm. you've got Nehru, mm -hmm. Sukarno, uh, Chuck, yes, yes, that's right, I mentioned him. Um, Castro was a big factor. Mm -hmm. So he, he was a global figure mm -hmm. while he was in power in Ghana, and that didn't go just because he'd gone to Conakry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little bit about uh, the actual the actual act of getting these letters and papers from Conakry and getting them onward to to to. Ah, oh, that was quite a problem. Yes, after um, the secretary managed to stay in power a few years after Nkrumah died, um, but he was eventually overthrown in a coup again under very suspicious suspicious circumstances. And I was worried at the time because I thought, what's ha going to happen with a military regime there and so on? Do the correspondence files and all this historical material, which I knew must be still in Villa Silly, mm -hmm. but I thought that at least, you know, the material there would be put either in a safe place or it would be guarded in that villa. I, but I didn't, I underestimated really the <laughs> what could happen there. But um, after Secretary had gone, there was 
military regime, and of course, and I couldn't get a visa or anything to go, but I wanted to go as his literary executories to see what had survived and uh, make a list of everything that was there and so on, not necessarily to bring it back. But in the end, I had to go without a visa and just risked it. it was 1987. Um, and it was just as well I went, actually. Because, but I took a bit of a, a risk, yeah, to say yeah. the least. <laughs> um, because the camera, the camera sana, the Guinea protocol officer that had been in charge at Villa Silly, you know, interpreting for Nkrumah and all this sort of thing, he was, of course, out of power. He was nobody. He was a very big man under Secretary's government. He was, in fact, Secretary's right-hand man that he um, drafted to serve Nkrumah. Um, he was just a nobody, but I, uh, he wrote me a, a, an air letter in 1980, the end of 86 or beginning of 87, out of the blue, because I was pondering how on earth I'm going to get out there. No Guinea embassy in London, and I couldn't get any contact f from their Paris embassy. They didn't want to know is any connection with Nkrumah or Secretary, and they wanted to know what my purpose of going there was. So it was a, there was a problem. Anyhow, fortunately I had this letter from Kamala Sana and he, he put a box number so I immediately wrote back and said I would like to come and just, you know, check to see what was still surviving and so on. He said he would, it was difficult, um, but he would meet me. So I couldn't get a visa, I decided to go without one. Um, Very brave. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a bit risky. When I got to Paris, of course, you had to change planes in Paris. They said, where's your visa for Guinea? I said, I haven't got one, but I'm afraid I told a white lie. I said, I'm being met by a government official. <laughs> it's all right, so they passed me anyhow. They were glad to have somebody to travel on Air Africa, I think. Uh, towards the end, th it stopped several times. Myself and two Lebanese businessmen were the only people that wanted to go on to Conakry. They all got off at Nurchat or somewhere, you know, in between. No, nobody, and especially, uh, they thought, well, uh, she's obviously not a tourist. You don't go to Conakry for I tourism. <laughs> but I got, had a big problem when I arrived, actually. I don't know whether you want to hear all this. Yeah, not all. Well, just I'll try and make it brief. Yeah. But, um, yes, it was a problem because you know, queuing up uh, to, to go through the um, formalities, mm -hmm. the checks. I immediately looked at my passport, where's your visa, you see, and I said, I haven't been able to get one. They said, well, wait over there, you see, and I thought, oh, Lord. It was the end of the day, and, and I thought, I'm just going to be put on the return flight back, you know, without a visa. But fortunately, camera did turn up, but he'd had trouble getting some old taxi or something to get there. He was really looking so down and out, poor camera. But anyhow, he turned up and he came and spoke to them in French. And they said, he said he would take charge of me and it, not to worry and all. But of course they didn't recognize him and he was a man of no importance then. But they said they would have to keep my passport and I would have to get a, a visa from the home office or whatever yeah. in Conakry before they would return my passport so it was a bit worrying actually I had to leave the airport without my passport but camera managed to get um, a photographer that got a bit of film left and we long story but he managed to get it so but then I getting to th see the papers was uh, see what was left in the villa silly was a problem because the military had taken over he said uh, camera told me that it was filled with soldiers and, but he thought the files and everything had been packed into tea boxes and sealed. And he would, I, I mustn't go near, he said, you must lie low mm. here in Conakry, lie low. I will see if I can, you know, see them and, and bring them to you. Um, fortunately, he said, the one of the, the commander there mm. of the garrison in Villa Silly came from his village okay. and he might be able to arrange something. Right. So, long story mm -hmm. short, in two or three days he um, managed to bring the this, this stuff to his little bungalow. I was staying in a, a very grotty little hotel, no air conditioning or anything, it was terrible uh, in, in Conakry. But anyhow, I went there to his place during the day and he brought the stuff there, but it was 
just thrown in the old house. The soldier had broken into the boxes looking for valuables, I suppose, and they didn't think papers were valuable, of course. No, not soldiers for you, but I'm glad they didn't think so. But they hadn't bothered sealing them or anything, so they'd been exposed to insects and all this sort of thing. I was just in time, really. But I realised I'd have to bring them back with me. So I had to give camera some money to go and buy a suitcase um, in the market. And I couldn't bring, I brought all the correspondence files back. I couldn't bring all his little library back. He had a small library of books there that he'd collected during the years. Most ones I'd sent or taken with me. And he always annotated his books. And so I had to sort through the ones that he had actually written in because I thought these would be valuable for students to see what comments or what he had marked as important. I was able to bring those back and his correspondence files, but I had to leave some that and hadn't got any marking. The camera would go back and secure them, you think? Yes, he brought everything that was, had been packed in these boxes. He had packed them, actually, when Nkrumah died, and he returned. Um, you know, Nkrumah had a state funeral in Conakry. Mm -hmm. um, so the camera came back with the body to... Um, to Accra. To, well, to Conakry. To Conakry. Yes, that's yes, right. Sorry. Yes, okay. that's right. Yes, uh, they wanted me to go, but I said, no, I I'm, I'm go to, to London from Bucharest. And carry on with the books. I'm, you know, if I'd been his wife or something, it'd been different. But I said, no, he would wish me to ensure the safety of his books. It wasn't appropriate for me to go. I thought his wife from Fatty would go. Fatty would go, yes, yeah, she didn't. Yes, yeah, yeah, she did go, yeah. Why did you choose Howard University as the, the, the place? Well, it is, yeah. some of the stuff I thought really should be placed in safe hands, especially the, the Correspondence files that had damage from mice had actually got into one of the boxes and they'd eaten the edges of the files and so on. They need it needed expert paper mm -hmm. care, you see. And I thought, well, there was nowhere in Africa that I could think of that had got the facilities and proper air conditioning and this, that and the other, paper experts. And I thought the material should be put on disk and all this sort of thing available for scholars. So the first thought was um, Howard University, which is the biggest black university in the world and got all the expertise in the world. And they had a research um, centre, the Morland Spingarn Research Centre. Mm -hmm. So I wrote to them first and um, no, no, I didn't write them first, that's right. I went out to see them, that's right, yes, to see if I thought it was suitable. Mm. Yes, the sequence, forgive me, but it's a long time ago now. Okay. Uh, I think I had made the contact, that's yes, right, yes. and then I decided to go and see for myself. And I was really very pleased with what I saw. And first thing you notice going into the mall and spin gone great pictures of Nkrumah, they had all his books in their library, and the students, of course, were very... Um, enthusiastic supporters of Nkrumah. In fact, Howard University um, tried to get him to be, um, you know, take a, a position at Howard University during the Conakry years. Some sort of honorary th um, something or other. But, it, you know, they recognised his importance and so on. So it was a suitable place uh, to deposit, you know, some of the material that couldn't um, wait. So they've got, they've got um, some very important material there. What do you think was Nkrumah's uh, greatest gift to Africa? What, what, if you could summarize? Indeed. Oh, I think his pan-African vision of a united continent. That was behind all his thinking and all his writing. Always talking about it. Because he thought that the um, position of the ordinary people in Africa could not improve until the continent was united and um, was in control of its own house, in other words. First thing always on his mind was the political kingdom, you see. Yes, <laughs> you know, you remember he emphasised that all the time. Until you have political control, you're in control of your own house, you can forget about your welfare, because other people will be coming in to take that, especially a, a rich continent like Africa. It used to drive him mad when people talked about poverty in Africa. I mean. He knew, obviously, the African people were poor, but he said people are mixing up. The continent is not poor. It's the richest continent yes. in the world with the poorest people. So something has to be 
wrong, you've got to ask the question, why is this the case? So all his writings really have this in, in view, really, the Pan-African um, context. The, his book, Challenge of the Congo, it, the subtitle is, um, oh, I can't remember the exact detail, but it, it's about the similar troubles in independent states, you know, that are not in control of their resources. And the challenge of the Congo was to s um, highlight the example of what had happened there. Um, of course, Union Minier had been exploiting, uh, you know, its resources were not benefiting the people of the Congo. But there's always this Pan-African um, vision. That's, that's the greatest, uh, I think, Well, how, did, how does it feel to have worked so closely to... How what? How does it feel to have worked so closely with... Well, I, I just a tremendous honour. I mean, uh, for a historian to <laughs> meet with someone who's making history, and then to be play a, a very minor part in it, you know, after the coup, um, that was perhaps the, the best experience really of the whole time because he had more time to reflect there. We had long conversations, you know, in Villa Silly that wouldn't have been possible while he was in government. It was too busy, you know. It was mostly checking his books and the texts of his books, but we had time to talk about what was going on in the world and all this sort of thing. I got to know him much better after 66. But it was a tragedy for the whole of Africa, really, that um, I think Kaunda is a bit of a gloomy person, but he said Africa will never recover from it. I think they will, because his vision has lived on. But it has did set back the clock in Africa, there's no doubt about it before the coup in Flagstaff House in the sort of waiting room uh, adjoining his office there waiting to go in and sometimes I'd been there with ambassadors and important people sitting there and he would send for me first you see because he his books were so important he wanted to get that done and really I got some nasty looks from some of these people that thought you know who's this blooming woman going in ahead of us I'm a big cheese here <laughs> you know <laughs> but he, Total disregard for that sort of thing. No standing on ceremony. It was what no was standing on ceremony at all. No. And the ability to make everybody in the party or yeah. was in the circle feel that they were important and their role in history was as important as his. Yeah. I, I well, Erica told me once that she had this little office, you see, adjoining his in Flagstaff House, and she was very amused at cabinet meeting. She said all she could hear was roars of laughter, you know, and it was always a jolly occasion. <laughs> Yeah, he, he, I'm, I've never seen him. He, he couldn't stand people that put on airs at all. But in practice, he carried out, in practice, his uh, door was open to anyone, you know, market women would come. Erica used to get a bit concerned because, for his security after a while, because, you know, there, there was a bit of discontent in the country from yes, certain so quarters, yeah. and there were Two bomb incidents, Indeed. you remember, Indeed, yes. his life was in danger and she thought it was dangerous for these people coming out, but he, he didn't like shutting the door on anyone. But after a while, his security people you see, began to take control and said, we can't go on like this, any Tom, Dick and Harry coming, but it wasn't his wish to be shielded from anyone. You wanted to speak about the last time you saw him in Ghana. Oh, yes. Was, uh, before he left for Hanoi. That's a very strong memory I have, yes. There was a, a lot of talk of coups at that time because in January, um, the last time I saw so him was in February, but in January there'd been a coup in Nigeria mm -hmm. and Balewa's government yes. had been overthrown. So it was the talk was on people's lips. It was a dangerous sort of time. And I got the feeling for the first time, usually when I arrived on my trips there, and I can't remember the exact number of times I went before the coup, but it was very often, um, I'd always felt sort of elated <laughs> getting out of the aircraft. A, and it, there was a sort of happy atmosphere, you know, children, school children going to school with their satchels. It, it seemed to be a happy time, building going on, Tema Highway being built. But that last visit, there was a bit of unease, and even with the Volta opening, there was a big dinner they had, I think it was the night before, 
Anyhow, Kaiser was there, one of the people that had helped with financing the Volta Dam. And the lights suddenly all went out. And I thought, this is very odd. Um, so we were in total darkness. We were all sitting there, you know, this big occasion, masses of tables, hundreds of people there, including Kaiser. But they came on again. And I, I thought, <laughs> I hope that's not a, a no men. But people were a bit jumpy, and especially um, those close to him, even his wife, didn't want him to leave the country. Because there were talk of coups, and there were a bit of discontent with shortages of various food. It's part of the economic sanctions that were being applied insidiously with Ghana. Do you remember the price of gold and cocoa, the main export, suddenly dropped on the world market? There were these sort of pressures that Mugabe's facing now, insidious, but not claimed by anyone, but they had their effect. So there was a slightly uneasy feeling. But the, yes, you asked me the last time I actually saw him was in the castle. He didn't often work there, but occasionally he would use his office there, and it was in the castle. And we were going through the page proofs of Challenge of the Congo, and suddenly there was a knock at the door, and um, it was either the foreign minister or somebody from the foreign ministry came in, said there'd been an urgent cable from the Ghana embassy in Washington um, that ha he had to show Nkrumah. And it was, the message was, that the Americans had agreed to stop the bombing of Hanoi for three days to allow his plane to land safely. Because Ho Chi Minh had sent a message previously saying, I cannot guarantee the safety of your plane coming on this peace mission because the Americans are still bombing Hanoi. So the Americans had sent this desperate for him to go because <laughs> they wanted him out of the country, clearly. Um, it wasn't foreseen at the time, but um, of course Nkrumah was determined to go. He reckoned he had a va um, viable peace plan. And I, th I think he, he probably did have. But the main thing was the Americans were terrified that he wouldn't go, in which case their plans for the coup in his absence would not be successful uh, if he was still on Ghanaian soil. However, I was there when that message arrived. And Nkrumah I, d I don't know, he, I don't think he suspected, obviously, that it would happen. But it was, people were jumpy a bit at that time. Anyhow, he was determined to go, and he's, he's, it was only a few days, really, before he said, why don't you stay on here? We've been working very hard, you know, on the page proof. Stay and have a bit of a holiday, and when I come back, we can finish it off. Fortunately, I said, I think I better get back with it now because the London publishers were waiting to, you know, do the final processing. And also, I wasn't frankly interested in a holiday without him being there. The, the whole joy of being there was working with him. And so there seemed nothing, no point in staying on. Fortunately, I, no, I did leave. And with the page proofs, corrected page proofs. So that was very important, actually. Um, but, no, he was determined to go. Mm. Apparently there were two plans that, um, I, uh, this is what was discovered, I think, afterwards. There were two plans, there was a British plan. The British were in on it, it wasn't just a CIA thing, and I think West Germany intelligence was also in on the scheme. The British one, Harold Wilson's plan, was to get him assassinated as he walked the aircraft, before he left. Um, but the American plan was, no, do it when he's so far away that he can't, you know, he can't return. And actually it didn't happen until his plane had reached Rangoon. It was too late to return in 24 hours. But the, the um, so the American plan was adopted. And, well, it did work out as we know, but um, the, the Harold Wilson plan, in a way, it's credit to Harold Wilson, if you can see it that way, that he didn't underestimate Nkrumah. He knew that he would still be a threat as long as he was alive, whereas the American underestimated him, they thought, no, he'll be, once he's out of power, that's the end of him. We'll hear no more about him. Total underestimation. Hmm. So I was there actually seeing this ploy, you see, in the final... Um, think, I, I think Nkrumah couldn't have gone if, if it 
the bombing had continued because Ho Chi Minh wasn't prepared to receive him on those conditions. No, no, it could not die. It would be, yes, he could well have been um, shot down because there was very heavy bombing going on at the time. Yes, yes, there was a lot of bombing. Mm. So again, that reinforces the the theory that well, we all know now. I mean, it's so it's commonly claimed. In fact, the CIA have claimed it as a victory. That one of their chief operatives has written a book, In Search of Enemies, in which he said that was, he got a promotion, the CIA man in a craft, for the successful coup. Yeah.